Good morning, Pearlside Church. We want to welcome you here this morning. And those of you that are watching online, we're so, um, we're so happy that you could join us here this morning. I have an encouraging word for us. In Psalms 108, 1 to 2, it says, My heart, O God, is focused and determined. Now I can sing my song with passionate praises. Awake, O my soul, with the music of his splendor. Arise, my soul, and sing his praises. Church, we invite you to stand with us this morning as we give our praises to God and ask him to awaken our soul this morning. So will you lift up your voice and just sing his praises? We thank you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this verse. There is a sound. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of a Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Come on, faith, rise up. Oh, he loves your praise. Sing, there is a sound. There is a sound. I love to hear it's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Come on, let faith rise up, let the faith. Come on, sing this chorus. Awake my soul. Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Oh, 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 awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Awake your souls this morning. We may be tired, we may be grumpy, but he is a good God. So let's praise him this morning, yes? Sing, there is a sound. There is a sound that changes things. It's the sound of his people on their knees. Awake oh, up, you slumbering. It's time to worship him. Awake oh, my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud sing his praise aloud come on sing awake my soul oh, awake my soul and sing sing his praise aloud sing his praise aloud and when he moves and when he moves and when we pray we're stood a wall now stands away where every promise Hold on to that promises and sing. And when he moves, make no mistake. The bowels of hell begin to shake. All hail the Lord, all hail the King. Sing hey. Hey. Oh, oh let the King of glory enter in. There's something powerful when we sing out loud. It is the confession of our mouths. He enjoys our praise. He enjoys your voice. Sing his praise aloud. Awake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Woo, let's give us 
some praise this morning. He hears your praise. Would you join with me as we pray, church? The Lord put on my heart, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. God, we thank you for your power. We come before you as a church in unity for your spirit to pour down on us. We want to receive a fresh and new side of you, Lord. And so we come before you, God, humbling ourselves before your throne because we believe and declare that you are a good and sovereign God. So we thank you for such a time as this, a pivotal time where you have called every single one of us to further your kingdom. So stir something in our hearts today, this morning. So we pray for a gust, a rush of wind to reach us all right now, to give us courage, to give us hope as we walk into this next season, God. And so we thank you for revival. We thank you for restoration in your name. Amen. Thank you, God. Let's sing this verse. Spirit rushing. Spirit sound rushing wind. Fire of God fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent. As we repent, turn from sin. Revival embers smoldering. Breath of God, fan us into flame. We need a fresh wind. Yes. The fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out. Pour it out, Lord. Pour your spirit out. Pour it out. Pour it out. Sing verse 3. For hearts that burn with holy fear, purified in faith and deed, Refiner's fire, strengthen what remains. So we the church. So we the church, beg on light, lamp of flame, city bright, king and kingdom, come is what we pray. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out.
fragrance of heaven pour your spirit out pour your spirit out a holy anointing the power of your presence pour your spirit out 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 in this act of worship, church. Sing, mm-hmm. I'm calling. I'm calling on the God of Jacob. Whose love? Whose love endures through generations. I know. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses. The one. The one who opened up the oceans. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Come on, let's ask and receive. Receive him today, church. Sing, oh God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. We need him. We need you, God. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. Oh, he's a faithful God. Can we believe for that this morning? Oh, sing, I'm calling on the God of Mary. I'm calling on the God of Mary. Whose favor, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. Come on, let's believe and declare that. I'm calling on the God of David. Who made, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giant. Oh God, my God, I Get out to him. God, I need you now. How I need you now. Cry out to your God. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. He's faithful. On your faithfulness. Sing, oh, God. Oh, God, my God, I need you. We need you. you. Oh, God, my God. Do it alone, God. So we cry out to you. Oh, rock, oh, rock rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Use this time, church, to just cry out how much you need him. Cry out how much he's a good God, how sovereign he is, how holy he is. He loves to hear your voice. Oh, let's sing this. You heard your children then. You hear your ch- He hears you. Believe for that. You are the same God. You are the same God. 
you answer prayers you're answering them right now you are the same God you are the same he is a provider you're providing right now you are the same God you are let something stir up in your hearts by declaring how good he is God move in power now you are the same God you are the same he is a healer you are a healer then you are a healer now you are the same he's the same you are the same he's a savior he's your savior so faithful he is so good you deserve all the praise oh yeah he's the same god let's sing this last verse i'm calling i'm calling on the holy spirit Almighty river, come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. One more time. Come and fill me again. Yes. Let's give God some praise. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus. I don't know about you, but I need to be filled by His Spirit today. How many of you need to be filled by the Spirit of God today, right now, this morning? Let's give God some praise. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this physical expression of just putting our hands out. And what we're going to do is we're saying, God, we need you. And I'm going to do this right with you. God, we come before you right now and we ask for you to fill us up right now. Because, God, we know that we are in a pivotal time where things are just constantly changing. From gas prices to inflation to even the election. There's so many things that are so uncertain. But, God, we know that we can be certain that you are the same God. That you are not changing. You are the same yesterday. You're the same today. And you will be the same tomorrow. So, God, we choose right now to say, God, fill us up. God, fill us up with your spirit. Fill us up with your power. Fill us up with your love and your compassion. And most importantly, your peace. So, God, we want to lay it down and say, God, have it all. Have it all. Because, God, we know it's all about you and not about us. So, God, we ask for an impartation of your spirit this morning. We don't just want to hear a sermon or a message, but we want to experience your presence this morning today. Because, God, we know a revival is coming. So, God, we ask for a revival to happen in all of our hearts today personally. In our minds, in our hearts, in our souls. God, we ask for you to revive us in the name of Jesus. But, God, we ask for a fresh wind to blow through this place. And we ask that your will be done in Jesus' name. And everybody said, let's give God some praise. Amen, amen. Well, welcome to Pearl Side Church. We're so glad that you decided to join us here on this beautiful Sunday morning. And as you take your seats, go ahead and turn to someone next to you, slap them. I'm just kidding, don't slap them, but just say, hey, it's time to wake up.
All right, well, welcome to Pearlside Church. My name is Lex and Lomibau. I'm the Educations Director here at Pearlside Downtown. And if you're new, we just want to say welcome and know that you are here on purpose for a purpose. Because our heart here at Pearlside is to help everyone know God, follow God, discover their purpose, and make a difference by helping others do the same. And we also want to take this time to welcome everybody tuning in online, whether you're tuning in from the toilet, from your bathroom, from the kitchen, from the beach, from your car, from the gym, from a hike, wherever you're at. We want to say welcome and thank you so much for joining us. And if you are here on the island of Oahu, we want to lovingly encourage you to come actually in person because can we all agree that there's a different level of impartation and experience when you're around God's people? Can I get an amen from everybody in the house? So we want to see your beautiful faces. And let's give God some praise one more time. I just feel the joy of the Lord in this place this morning. I don't know about you, but welcome. And we would love to see your beautiful faces next week in person if you can. And we also want to encourage you to share the link with somebody that you love that you know that needs some hope today. And now we're also talked about some next steps. One practical next step that you can take is by signing up for our discipleship track. Everyone say discipleship track. That's a lot of syllables, I know. But it's going to be a good class. It's actually beginning today, right after this service, right at 1030, right at room 105. I'm going to be teaching that class. I'm not saying that's why you need to come. I'm not that smart. I'm from Los Angeles, public, high school, public schooling. I'm just, by the grace of God, I'm here. But we want to see you there because this four-week session is going to teach you and show you how to be transformed by the gospel, how to be equipped for ministry, and also be equipped to influence the world and the specific place that you are placed in. How many of you want to make an eternal difference with the gifts that God has given you? All right, come on. So if that's you, I want to encourage you to even come see us. You don't even have to register online. If you want to join us today, we'll go ahead and assist you. But we want to see you out there as well. And now we are beginning a new series. Now, I know I get fired up a lot and I say to really lean in, but I really want to encourage you from the bottom of my heart to really lean in because this is a pivotal and timely series that we're going through. Because how many of you know that we're living in kind of a dark, uncertain, scary time right now? From seeing the one of the, the worst economic recessions that we can possibly see, from seeing even just we're kind of coming out of a global pandemic. So it's a pivotal time for us. And that's why the series is titled Discerning These times. So I want to encourage you to really lean in this morning. And the one bringing the message is our own downtown congregation pastor, Tim Ma. Yeah. All right, come on. Good morning, church. It's good to see you all here today. And uh, we want to welcome you because we believe that God has brought us here for a very pivotal time, as Lexan was alluding to. And in light of this message, uh, I, I, I do want to just stand with my brother here as he was exhorting you to come through the discipleship track, one of the phrases he used, because, you know, lots of energy, I feel it too, fires me up. Um, he said, if you want to get equipped for ministry, no one's going to force you to go to the class, and no one's going to force you to say, hey, you need to get equipped for ministry. And when we hear that, some of us were like, well, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, you know, or I work at fast food or retail, or I'm in marketing, no matter where God has you, as a follower of Christ, there is a call to be equipped for ministry. And we see it in Scripture. This is not just some clever thing we came up with as a church, but it's very evident in Scripture that the, the role of the full-time ministers like myself and Lexin is to equip the believers, the followers for ministry. And so we want to encourage you, if you've never come through the discipleship track, or maybe you've hit a stagnant point in your life and you notice that you've kind of just been going through the, the doldrums and the, the motions at work and you haven't really been having that perspective, how can I minister to the people around us? Uh, it would be great for you to come back through the discipleship track even if you came through it before to fire up that motor to believe God to do something great through your life. So that's our prayer for every one of us, that we can honor God with our whole lives. And that's going to be the essence of today's message. So we are in this series, Discerning These Times. And I think it's really important when we look at Discerning These Times, because uh, my wife and I, we got married in 2006. So yes, we've been married for 16 years. And the first place we moved into, um, it was a rental. It's in Reseda. That's where they filmed the Karate Kid, or, you know, as they say in the mainland, Karate Kid. 
and uh, in Reseda. That's where we lived, in one of those like back alleys like Daniel and his mom. And the crazy thing was every time we got out of the car, there were B-52s. They're, they're, they exist on the mainland as well. Uh, B-52s are the biggest brown cockroaches, right, that just are scurrying all over the island. And m- that's my wife's, like, mortal enemy. That's her biggest fear. And so even though we were just newlyweds, we were in our honeymoon phase, I was like a divorced man during that time because I'd be talking to her, and she's gone. She's like this, getting out of the car and getting straight into the apartment building. So we're like, we got to get out. And then her parents are like, yeah, this place is not too good. My parents are like, we're willing to help. So both sides of the family helped us get a down payment, and this was in 2007, to get our first place. Um, someone said, nice, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> but, but what wasn't nice was already there was murmur, murmur of a recession or a, a housing bubble. If for, for those of us who were maybe in real estate or in finance back then, we were already hearing a lot before it happened in 2008. There was already a lot of rumblings in 2007. And we were hearing it, and like, I'm Chinese, like I got my money radar just constantly, you know, I was like, is this a good time to buy or is this not a good time to buy? And we were so, we we're young, we we're naive. We didn't really understand everything, like interest rates and all that, got ourselves into a bad loan, like many others during that time, uh, because that's the only way we could afford the place. You know, stated docs, that was a thing before, for those of you who do mortgage. If you remember, in the 2000s, the stated income, where you don't even have to prove how much you made. And then, so the guy that was hang- handling our mortgage was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know what, um, can you state this? What? Okay. You know, and just like guiding us through the whole form without furnishing any documentation. And we got our loan. We got our place. Uh, but a year after, that's when everything went upside down in the housing industry. And then we were in this deep recession as a country. And uh, it was not good for us. It was very stressful. And we were thinking, why did we not listen? Why did we not discern the times? And so we had to deal with that property in which we were upside down in for many years. Even after moving back to Hawaii in 2011 and being back at this church, we still had to keep that property because we're so upside down on the loan. And it was, it was just this nightmare dealing with bad tenants that didn't pay rent. And we weren't, you know, we couldn't even pay our own rent in Hawaii. Like, it's, it's just this, like, crazy conundrum we're in. And it was a mess. And I share that because, metaphorically speaking, spiritually, there is a crisis going on. There is an awakening and an alarm that God is ringing, and he's asking us, will we hear it? Will we respond? Before I go any further, I do see some new faces here, and I promise you, normally the messages are not like this, uh, but this is going to be a heavier type of message. Normally, uh, and I don't purposely try to be funny for the sake of being funny, um, but that's just who I am, so jokes naturally come out, but if you're like, man, like, did Pastor Tim not sleep good last night? Like, why is he so angry today or intense? Uh, there's a reason for that. I'm not trying to manufacture that intensity neither. It's just the tone of the word and the message in which we're receiving today. So I'm just trying to get in alignment to what God wants us to hear. And so I say that as a little disclaimer because especially if you're just visiting us today, please come back, okay? If this is not how we preach every single week. I promise you, go, go ahead and ask anyone else around here. They'll, they can attest to that. Um, but, but nonetheless, this is a very important word, and we're not going to back down from it. We're neither are we going to shy away from it because that's how important it is. And so as Lexan alluded to earlier in our opening prayer, when we talk about discerning these times, let's just even take a quick inventory of what's going on. So he made mention of us coming out of a, a global pandemic in which we still feel the effects to this day. And it's still, there's still residue of that, of COVID, and people still get sick, and there's still issues. Like, uh, and, and we love this church where we leave it up to you if you want to be masked or unmasked. But prior to the pandemic, there was no one masked unless you're in Asia, like different countries in Asia. Now here, I say half of us are masks, and that's totally fine, by the way. I'm not trying to alienate one side or another. One more disclaimer I do want to say real quickly. Um, As I talk about certain issues today, know that I'm talking about spiritual issues. So if you are hearing it from a political view or lens, please get that lens out and filter out. I'm trying to preach 
from a spiritual issue. So I will be talking on some issues of politics, but I'm not trying to sway anyone on one side or the other. In this church, I believe, and some of you are like, what? How can you believe this? So this might be a controversial statement. I believe you can be saved and be Republican. I believe you can be saved and be Democratic or Democrat. So you can be blue or you can be red, and but yet we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Okay, that's what unifies us, and that is our ultimate authority in our life, not a political party. Okay, so I believe that we can both exist in here or whatever. Maybe you're some other party. There's a new one that just started up, you know, a Chinese guy. <laughs> and so, <laughs> not mine, by the way. And, and so no matter what you hear today, just constantly frame it back in, okay, what God, what are you speaking to me? Not your political affiliation or preferences or standing, all right? So, um, so we just came out of a global pandemic. We're heading into, and some people already say the recession is here, but economists are saying that, you know, it's, it's pending. And it's, you know, some people are saying it's here because the, for two quarters in a row, the, the GDP has dropped. And that normally signals a recession, but there's people that are contradicting that. But it looks very likely we're in a recession. However, what you cannot deny is that for, since 40 years ago, we have not seen inflation like what we're seeing right now. I got a lot of kids to feed. That's a lot of eggs I need to buy. So trust me, I know about this inflation. I see it firsthand uh, when we go to Costco. And so inflation is already here. That's obvious. And then you turn on the news, you read anything, you see a lot of corruption, whether it's in media, whether it's in politics, or even in the medical industry and field. All aboard, all across the board, there's, there's corruption everywhere. So what is, what is God doing? What is happening right now? Well, if we were to go back during the Old Testament times, God is issuing a prophetic warning during King Solomon's reign. It's the golden age of Israel. Things are going pretty good. But God is issuing a caution to them to be aware of what's happening. And so we're going to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and look at verse 13 and 14. And this is going to be our guiding scriptures for today as we receive the word of God. When I shut up the heavens, this is God speaking, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that your word is not just archaic, dead, uh, forgotten, holy words, but it is living and active, it is sharper than any double-edged sword. So we pray, Lord God, let your perfect word come and have your way inside each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so here at this church, what I love about Pearlside is we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. The fountainhead of God is the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not on vacation, okay? It's not like after the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit's like, I did my work and I'm done on this earth. But we believe that the Holy Spirit is well and alive today, and that's inside each and every one of us, and that's inside this church well, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the prophetic word and the office of a prophet. And so we believe in that in this church, the gift of prophecy. And one of the world's most respected prophet is actually a pastor in our very own ministry, our larger ministry. Uh, outside of the Pearlside family, we are also affiliated with Every Nation Ministries. It's a global ministry. And uh, that pastor I'm referring to, his name is uh, Pastor Jim LaFoon. And not even just esteemed within our own ministry, but recognized globally amongst other tr Christian bodies as well. He was the one that months, months, months before the first reporting of anything of COVID already saw. God gave him this vivid vision that rocked him in his soul about this, this wave and plague of death coming out of Asia and affecting the whole world. And then two months later, this, so this was like 
probably around the end of summer when he was receiving this. And then two months later, that's when, you know, like October, November, uh, was it 2020? We started hearing news of that, or 2019, I'm sorry. We started hearing news of that, and it reached our shores in 2020, right? And so that, that was what was, God was showing him way before anyone else even knew about it. And, uh, and then even in our church here, many of our leaders have been prophesied. Um, soon to take over the main campus, uh, Pastor Billy Lyle. We believe that prophetic word is meant to encourage, but also to uh, help carry someone through even a difficult time. And so what God showed Pastor Jim, that was a specific word for Pastor Billy, his wife Naomi, and especially for Micah, before Micah even had any major issues as a, as a, as a child, Pastor Jim saw it coming. But he said, don't lose hope. Even though it's going to be a, he, and he named like a specific time frame, I believe it was like three years, that, 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 that relief will come and, and your son will be healed and he's going to be fine. Don't worry. But it was three years. It was three years of navigating that. And he's one of my best friends and closest friends here, Pastor Billy. And so I was walking him through that and saw him just as a family going through a real difficult time. But they kept holding on to that promise. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. God's going to deliver him and he's going to deliver our family. And sure enough, to the day, Micah was healed. And it's amazing how the prophetic word is such a powerful thing. And so recently in June, Pastor Jim received another prophetic word. And this is for our nation and for the Western church, referring to us and the American church. And we're going to read an excerpt of that prophetic word, which is going to set a spiritual frame for the rest of this message. On June 9th, 2022... The Lord gave me a powerful vision about the United States of America. He continued to speak to me over the next 48 hours. I saw Jesus. And by the way, he literally, Jesus visits him. I'm so jealous. It's amazing. I, I, I know I'm with Jesus and I love Jesus. Jesus literally comes into his bedroom. Okay. So he says, I saw Jesus. He was walking across America and his tears were falling on the parched ground. I could not see his face clearly, but as I drew closer, the Holy Spirit focused my vision on his feet. They were covered with a thick coating of dust. Jesus began to speak to me, and this was the essence of what he said. We chose to use America to reach the world. We have sent revival after revival to your shores. No army of people could have ever destroyed America. Only Americans could destroy America, and that is what has happened. With these words ringing in my ears, Jesus stopped and looked up into heaven. He began to pray, please, Father, one more time, one more time, one more time. Then I realized he was asking his Father to send another revival from heaven. His petitions seemed to go on endlessly, yet he never lost his passion Finally, the Father spoke from heaven, okay, one last time. I looked at the scene before me and the Holy Spirit focused my eyes once again on Jesus' dusty feet. As I pondered the vision, I realized we were in danger of the Godhead shaking off the dust of our nation because of America's ongoing rejection of the gospel. I asked Jesus, when will this revival begin? He said, the first drops are already falling. Then Jesus spoke to me again and said, tell my church to create cisterns or spiritual water storage systems to trap the first drops of revival rain. These words left me with an unusual sense of urgency. And I realized we had to create fresh space in our church for the Holy Spirit to move and touch lives. The Holy Spirit impressed upon me that without these first drops, our people would not have the spiritual strength they needed in order to press into the fullness of the outpouring which would to come soon. As this vision was coming to an end, the Holy Spirit spoke these words to me repeatedly. It's not business as usual. It's not business as usual. It's not business as usual. Despite our country's spiritual and moral decline, America remains the world's greatest missionary and sending nation. 
it is also the primary bulwark against the brutality of totalitarian nations bent on regional and global domination and conquest. May God grant us the strength we need to respond in this hour. So this is what is a prophetic frame in which our church dearly believes is happening right now. And oftentimes we can criticize other churches like, oh, we do so much more than the other churches. I think this prophetic word is for them. But, uh, but if we look back at Second Chronicles, which we will, chapter 7, it says, if my people... So he's not referring to if they, he's saying my people, and we are God's people, amen? So this word is for us to receive what's happening. So what's going on? God is sovereign and is awakening his people. He's awakening us. He's awakening me. Second, Second Chronicles, uh, going back to our main text, verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain... Or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. So pestilence among my people, I mean, we've never been through a, a pandemic like we've ever been in terms of our generation, right? Those of us who are living right now in this, I hope you're living. In, in this generation, we've never experienced this kind of pestilence or sickness shutting down the world. Uh, locusts devouring the land. So Already, like we talked about the inflation and then the pending recession that some say are already here. And then there's no rain. That's the first part. And uh, for those of us who watch YouTube, you see the, those YouTube videos of Lake Mead. It used to be a lake. It's now like Puddle Mead. And that's supposed to be the, the western region of the U.S.'s water reserve. And it's almost dried up to nothing. And so there's no rain, there's the locusts devouring the economy, and then we have COVID, and then now monkeypox, right, going around the nation. So what's happening here? This is an alarm that's going off, and just like when, when we as a church and other churches were going through the height of the pandemic, many of us, we were desperately crying out to God. We were seeking God with fervency. Remember that? But then what's happened now? Now that the pandemic is waning and mass mandates have dropped and we're free to travel again, we have went, we left spiritual urgency and now we're in a position of spiritual complacency. And I, again, don't, don't think like, oh yeah, that guy next to me, because he went to Vegas seven times. I only went two times. Okay, this is, this, like, everything I'm saying, I'm saying to myself, and I pray that everything you're hearing today, you're hearing for yourself. Take a spiritual inventory. Where have I been? Where was I during the pandemic when the alarm first went off and we woke up? We're like, oh, God, we need to pray. We need to get right. We need to reach our friends that don't know you. And then now that things are, like, settling down for the most part and it doesn't seem as dire as it was two years ago, vaccines and whatever, like, oh, yeah, people are okay. You know, it's fine. Just get quadruple boosted, six shots, whatever. I'm good. It's, it's waned where we're at. And it's like what, we, what happened is, you know, I hate like my old alarm clock when I had in high school and college. It would just do that annoying beep. <laughs> now like with the iPhone, you can choose your tones, right? But, but that <laughs> like, like we're like, okay, God, enough, irritating. And we, we press the snooze button on God. But let's spiritually wake up as we receive the word not just from Second Chronicles, but even this timely prophetic word from Pastor Jim really showing us what is happening here. And I know that as I read it, it's resonating in your soul like it did in mine. And so what, what, what are we to take away from this? God is our source, and he's calling for our lives to be filled with prayer and repentance. So Second Chronicles, as we go back into 7, verse 14 now says, If... My people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, right now, there's, it's so easy and the, the country is so polarized and divided to say they need to turn from their wicked ways. They need to cut that out. They need to stop. They need to change. But God is saying, if my people humble themselves... And seek my face 
and turn from their wicked ways. So this is going to cut a little bit, but the wicked ways are in us. And because of the lack of humility oftentimes, or we try to compare ourselves to those outside the church, or maybe those that we don't disagree with other types of churches, like, yeah, those are their wicked ways. They need to repent. They need to cut out that wickedness. But humility, if we place ourselves in this position of humility, we hold up the spiritual mirror of our lives, and then God starts to identify and show us exactly those specific areas. Because in a room this size, we are all going through different things. We're all going through different challenges and trials. And because of that, we are going through different areas of compromise. And only you and God know. And the Holy Spirit, if you don't know, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Because he knows he will show you lovingly. If we were to humble ourselves. So this What's happening right now is no different from what has happened since the beginning in history. And we look at the Israelites. So we have this chart here. On your far right, you see oppression. So that's what it was like, you know, being locked down. I felt like I was going stir crazy. I love my family. I love my wife, my four kids. They probably thought they were going crazy too with the loud Chinese guy in their house. Like just, you know, blasting out the walls. And uh, oppression. Oppression is when we go through a difficult time. Some of us right now, maybe in whatever situation right now you're in, maybe you're having a hard time finding a job, maybe you're dealing with some health issue, or maybe it's some relationship issue and you're really challenged. That's oppression. As a country, we are going through this thing of oppression with eco economics and, and various issues of division. And so what happens, right? When oppression happens, even the non-believer can cry out, right? You ever, like, watch those movies and, and, and a guy is falling. They're like, oh, God, and they're falling. That's just naturally what happens inside of us when we hit a breaking point. We cry out and we look for God. But especially as a believer, we do that. And because of Jesus' blood and his righteousness, he's given us free access for God to hear us. And so we cry out, we pray, and we did that as a church. And then God answers, and there's deliverance. And oftentimes the deliverance, because of who God is, he is good, he is a blesser, and he brings the blessings. The blessings now be, replace the blesser and become God in our lives, and that's what it means by idolatry. It doesn't mean we have Chinese statues at home and we're burning incense and bowing to Buddha or whoever else. Some other false god. Idolatry is when we put something higher than God and more important than God in the affections of our heart. In the place of where he belongs. On the throne of our heart. The way we make our decisions. The things that we aspire to. Is God at the center of those things. And so that's what idolatry looks like. And so when we talk about repentance, we talk about humility, it's identifying what are those areas that have taken the throne seat of God in my life, in my household, in my business, in my pursuit of my career. Is God at that throne seat? And that's what it looks like. When we talk about wickedness, we're not talking about going down the street and kicking dogs and puppies. We're talking about allowing the blessings of God to become our God rather than God himself. But here's the good news. God is merciful. And he wants to heal our country. So the if is on us. Okay, It's not about God, if you will do this, he will. But if we respond correctly, he says, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. See, I think we got our prayers backwards. All, a, a lot of us, we, we talk about the healing of the land, healing of the land, healing of the land. God's saying, well, if you repent, if you seek my face, if you humble yourself, if you turn from your wicked ways. And that's what repentance looks like. If you turn from my, your wicked ways is the essence of repentance. It's realizing that, God, you haven't been first place in my life. God, I haven't been fully committed to you. So that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the thing that pains me about the, I don't want to sound like I'm just like, I'm talking about all of us, including myself, is in the Western church, it's so easy to lose our desperation for God. 
And it's easy to think we're doing good with God by giving God maybe 80%. Like, that's pretty good of our heart. You know, because that's way higher. Like, in 80% in school, like, for those of us who just got by and got, like, C's and D's and passed. Like, 80%, like, that's really good, right, God? But for God, he is our creator. He is the Lord of lords and king of kings. He deserves 100%. He doesn't deserve some of it. He deserves all of us. And so when we talk about repentance and turning to God, it's our whole bodies, our every essence of who we are, turning completely. Not just, I got you, God. You got my eyes. You got my neck. But this part of me right here is still out somewhere else. But I'm fully committed and vested in you. Can we do that as a church? I know that's a huge call. And we're going to have a response time at the end today to allow the Holy Spirit to search us to see where we are at with that. But that's what God is asking for. And then he will heal our land. So we talked about crying out. We talked about prayer. And it's not just praying for ourselves. Because we're, we're pretty good at that. I don't have to teach you how to pray, you know, for those of us who are believing for a promotion or believing for a new house. Like my family and I have been for year, the last few years now. We've been desperately crying out for God. My kids have been praying with us for that new house. We don't have to teach you how to pray for your own things. But oftentimes we forget to pray as a church for the bigger things. And you are the church, okay? So I'm talking about even in your private time with God when you pray, are you just praying for yourself or are you praying for God to move across this land? So 1 Timothy chapter 2 exhorts us to do this. First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Not just for yourself, all people. For kings... And all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Let's take a moment and pause here. So for kings and, and, and people in high positions. So when's the last time you, play, you prayed for our government officials here locally? Instead of uh, how many of us had water cooler talks? Right, with our fellow co-workers and associates about how we're not happy with this thing or the rail or that, you know, corruption. But have we brought it to God and prayed for them? And so my kids, it's interesting um, because I, I started praying for these things and they heard me. So every night, I don't remind them, but they, they pray for end of the war in Ukraine and Russia. And that Russians would get saved, especially for Putin, so the idea here is, God, we should be praying for their salvation. Whether you like them or not, whether they're in the same political party that you root for or not, we need to be praying for those who are in positions of power. And a simple prayer is, God, bless them and let them know you, save them, if not, remove them. And then you just give it to God. And now it's no longer you having to be an advocate against them. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so Pastor Norman, um, he shares this story about the 80s. I was just a, I was born in the early 80s, so I was just a baby and a, a, a young child growing up in the 80s. But I remember hearing Cold War, Cold War. And then what is this Cold War? You know, are people fighting in the snow? And Pastor Norman was talking about... Um, and recounting the story of uh, the Washington for Jesus movement, where there was these two huge prayer gatherings in Washington, and people would be in the freezing snow crying out to God, just as we see here in Second Chronicles, believing for God, repenting, and for God to heal the land, heal the land. And during that same time, a presidential candidate, his name is Ronald Reagan, who was, for those of us who know Ronald Reagan, he was originally a Hollywood actor first before getting into politics. And so people were like, this, like they literally use these words, this stupid, dumb guy would never be able to be president. And so he was a dark horse in the presidential race. But yet, through the prayers of the people, believing and praying, he got elected. Because the, the pundits were dumbfounded. How did this guy get elected? Well, people were praying alongside of Pastor Norman. He was there in Washington, Hawaii boy, just freezing. 
just praying, speaking in tongues naturally, you know, because you're shivering. And uh, he was really believing God along with thousands of people gathered at D.C. Like now you see people protest at D.C., but the, the church was there praying fervently, believing God to heal the land, heal the country. And then President Reagan gets elected. And he wrote in his official autobiography, I decided we had to send as powerful a message as we could to the Russians that we weren't going to stand by anymore while they armed and financed terrorists and subverted democratic governments. Uh, British Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher's words says this, Ronald Reagan had ended the Cold War without firing a shot. Amazing. How did that happen? It's through prayer. He was a praying man. He was a praying president. And God gave him the wisdom and the strength to be able to do what he did to end the Cold War. Without firing a shot. Here's, here's the thing that, you know, sometimes we forget about the Cold War. You ever heard the phrase nuclear winter? So during the Cold War in the 80s, it was an arms race between the U.S. and the Russians who could get more nuclear warheads. At the time... In the height of the Cold War, it is estimated that the Russians and the U.S. each had 10,000 nuclear warheads. So as soon as one warhead went up, all the other warheads would go up. And those of you who are born after the 90s, we probably, you wouldn't have a world to be born into. You wouldn't have been born. This world came so close to an end. And, you know, now that we are in, 20, in the 2020s, by the way, if you're older here, like me, born in the 80s, they call that whole period the late 1900s. Okay, so if you lived through the late 1900s like I did, you heard about these events. And, but now it's all declassified and you get to see the details of how close. It wasn't just the Cuban Missile Crisis where people were so close to pressing that launch button. But there were numerous times, if you go back and just look at history, now that's all declassified where the nuclear weapons were almost triggered and fired. And this world would have been over. It would not be inhabitable if nuclear weapons were just shot off like that at that rate. So God, the people repented, people sought God's face, and God was faithful to heal the land. And that's the kind of moment we're in right now in this, his, in this time of history. So God works through his people and wants us to act. We close with Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, keys, you can come up. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Everyone say stand. Stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, everyone say stand again, stand firm, stand firm. See, the idea here is many of us, we, we see what's going on and we're just kind of just lounging. We're seated. The alarm's going off. But God's saying that the spiritual armor I've given you, the power, the authority for you to move mountains, we're just seated. But God's calling us to stand. Stand upon his promises. Stand upon his truth. Stand for what he is trying to do. For his kingdom come, his will to be done on this earth, on this earth as it is in heaven. And so what we see here, I'm going to close with two stories, uh, recent breakthroughs. Pastor Cheon, uh, while I was in L.A. for 10 years, his church wasn't too much farther from where we were in, when we were at Studio City at the church I was at. And I, I'd hear about the great things his church was doing and growing, uh, Harvest Rock out in Pasadena. And he's also president of Harvest International Ministry. Well, during the lockdowns, you know, they're in a blue state. And so it was very strict in what the church could and could not do. Basically, the church couldn't meet together to worship. Bottom line, the government tried to lock the doors down. And initially, when the lockdown was uh, just a blanket lockdown, like, okay, we get it. But the problem came when the government refused to allow the church to just come and worship our living God. 
but yet marijuana dispensaries and strip clubs were allowed to operate and open. That's not okay. And Pastor Cheon, knowing this, is like, we're going to open our doors. And I'm willing to be arrested for it. And so week after week, the church racked up fines of over a million dollars, but they kept standing. They kept worshiping. And then there was this indictment that came against him. Literally, the government was coming to arrest him, and he's waiting for his arrest. And then a lawyer came and was like, you know what? You don't have to get arrested for this. It's a violation of the First Amendment. And, of course, you know, the, the, the state court, like, laughed at that case and threw it out right away. And so he appealed to the Ninth Court. The Ninth Court, unfortunately, who he got was a very liberal judge, gave him 10 minutes of Zoom time. His lawyer wasn't even able to finish his defense. They threw it out. And so at this point, you think, man, God, I stood for you. I trusted you. What's happening? Well, God was up to something bigger and greater because finally it got up to the Supreme Court. And for those of us who have studied the judicial system and our, the way our country government works, if the Supreme Court makes a ruling on a certain issue, it sets precedence and perpetuity for future issues. And so here we are, Pastor Che. The Supreme Court, we, we know all the recent uh, conservative nominees that have taken seats because the people voted. Right? And the Supreme Court looked at him and said, no, you, you've been wrongfully fined, you've been wrongfully threatened with arrest, and they sided with Pastor Cheon. And so that sets precedence, not just for his church, but even for us locally and churches all across the U.S. Because he chose to stand. And one more story I want to share. You, you've been hearing a lot about separation of church and state, separation of church and state. Well, there's a, a coach, his name is Coach Kennedy, and he coaches at Bremerton, Washington, Joseph Kennedy. When he got the job, he made a vow that he knew it was God that got him that job. So he dedicated each game in the center of the football field, and he knelt to thank God. And so sometimes he'd pray out loud, but after a while there were murmurings that there were secularists that might sue the school because, you know, this is a state employee and he's praying in the middle of the football field, a state field, that's not okay. So the state said, yeah, you're, you shouldn't pray anymore. And he kept praying, but this time he was trying to comply but yet still honor God. So he prayed silently and just put his head down to honor God for 15 to 30 seconds. He got fired for that. So same thing, he appealed his firing, the the court threw that out, the ninth court threw that out, it got all the way to the Supreme Court. And just a few months ago, around the same time Jim LaFoon got this prophetic word, the Supreme Court said you were wrongfully fired and sided with Coach Kennedy. You know what that means for those of you who work for the state? Because of this Supreme Court ruling, you don't have to be in fear of being fired for representing your God. You can pray at work and then not have to worry, oh, I'm praying here at work. I wonder if I'm going to get fired. But God is doing something. God is already setting up the first raindrops of revival through these historic court rulings because these two men chose to stand. Now, the level in which we are called to stand may look a lot different from how these two men literally stood. But I want to encourage you, let's not miss whatever individual opportunities God is calling us to stand, to stand firm. And one of the practical ways, and you'll hear more about this at the end of service, is we just need to vote. We just need to vote. And I'm not telling you who to vote for, okay? So they're like, oh, here it comes. The pastor is going to tell us to vote one side or that side. No, that's between you and God. But don't don't just look at the mail-in ballot be like, ah, I'm What's the point, right? Some, some, and many of us, we've been jaded already by everything in politics and government. And we just like, ah, I don't care. But don't ever under, underestimate what God can do. Reagan became president and changed the face of this earth. Let's believe that as God is sending revival again, revival is when you see throngs of people, hundreds of people getting saved, like people you never thought co-workers that you're like man this is like you talk about heathen if you google heathen you see that co-worker's face smiling you know making devil horns 
Like, revival, when revival comes, those that you think will never get saved, get saved. But revival doesn't start on the outside. It first starts on the inside of his house, of his people, of our hearts. We need to allow revival to come right now and revive the spiritual fervency and faith that God is calling us to stand for him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for us right now. We can all bow our heads. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for being so merciful, for being so patient. But we also repent, Lord God, for taking, Lord, advantage of that. Oh God, you'll always love me. And so I don't have to reflect that type of level of love back to you because I know I can always come back to you. And yes, that is true, God, and we thank you for that. No one's more faithful than you. But we pray, God, right now that we would repent, Lord, for the times that we have been faithless towards you. Times that we, knowingly very well in our spirit, were called to stand and we didn't. Maybe not even in public settings, but even in private settings of compromise. Standing up for how you called us to live. Standing up for righteousness. Standing up for purity. Standing up to be able to trust you in certain areas of finances. Trust you in certain areas of our bodies and how we live. And so, Father God, we pray right now that you would search us, Lord. I'm going to allow us to just have a moment of silence as the, as the music continues to play. But the, the silence would be from us, but the Holy Spirit, I believe, will be speaking to each and every one of us in areas that we've compromised. And this is a moment for us as we hear and identify these specific areas, simply repent. Say, God, I turn from this and I turn to you. And I... I, I I'm sorry, God, but I choose now to pursue you and trust you, especially in this area. So let's go ahead and do that. And for some of us, it may be in multiple areas, but that's okay. God is good. He receives you. He loves you. But he's asking us, will we trust him? Will we trust that he is faithful? Will we be faithful? Thank you, Lord. Father God, we, we, we choose to turn from our wicked ways right now. We turn to a holy God. We turn to a perfect God. We turn to a loving God. And that's you. And we thank you, Lord God, that as we turn to you, there's something about your nature, your kindness that leads us to repentance. And so we fully turn away. We pray that it would not just be a half-hearted commitment for this moment. And that it would not be just the emotional decision in this moment. But Lord God, we make an eternal stand upon you, your faithfulness, your promises. So we thank you, God, that as we cry out to you for you to heal our land, for you to bring revival across this land, for you to use us to be a part of that revival, we thank you, God, it first starts within our hearts. So Lord, bring revival in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Even though we are not worthy, even though we are unclean, we say, here I am. And you see it all, and we give it to you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. As a response and a declaration, can we stand right now? We're going to respond in worship. We're going to cry out to God. And as we cry out to God about his faithfulness, I want us to realize that that same ability that caused Jesus to be faithful, even to the point of death on the cross, that same power lives inside of us. That we too can live with that kind of commitment and faithfulness as God as we continue to trust Him and look to His faithfulness. Amen. So let's cry out and sing about how God is our faithful God. He is our rock. Rock of ages means that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we can always depend on Him. We can always stand on Him and for Him. And He will not let us down. Amen. Let's worship.
providing you were providing then you are providing now you are the same God he is the same he's moving in power you move in power God move in power now God move in power now come on you are this he's the same you are he's a healer you are a healer then you are a healer now you are the same god you are he's a savior you are a savior then you are a savior now you are the same god you are the same god oh god my god i need you Oh God, oh God, we need, I need you, God. You now. How I need Come on, you cry out to Him. Now. Pray for this land. Heal the land, God. Oh God, the rock of ages. I'm standing on Your faithfulness. On Your faithfulness. Come on, sing that one more time. Oh God. humbly oh rock oh rock of ages i'm standing he's calling us to stand he's calling you to stand on your faithfulness father god we thank you lord that you are faithful you are true you are not a shifting shadow god but you are constant light and so we pray for the constant light of your love and your power, your grace, your mercy to come and shine down in the darkness of our hearts so that it can be filled, Lord God, with your presence. And Lord God, we turn away from worthless things. We turn away from the idols of our hearts and we turn to a full committed living for you. Let revival happen in our hearts, Lord God. And let us stand for you in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen, amen. Let's give him some praise. There's a, a few practical things I, I want to encourage us is, first of all, let's continue to be people of prayer. So let's continue to seek God. It's not just a one-time deal, you know, like I, I go through the car wash and then the car stays clean. No, it rains all the time in Hawaii and the car gets dirty again. And so in the same similar sense, right now you feel like, man, I'm so committed to God. But if we don't keep turning back to God daily, we're going to lose whatever is happening right now. So every day, even without the worship team, even not without Lexington's powerful prayers, we turn to him. Amen. We have the ability to turn to him. And then on a similar note, let's continue to be consistent and faithful and pressing in to our weekly services and small groups. Because we can't do it alone. We need to encourage one another, and the things sometimes we share may be the breakthrough that someone else needs to hear. And just coming to service is so different. Sorry, you know, I'm not trying to hate on you guys watching online right now, but the Holy Spirit moment we had right now would be a lot different if I was in my living room with my son running around in his bibbidees, you know, acting like Super Mario. That's what he does. It's me, Mario. And he just jumps around his bibbidees while I'm trying to watch TV. 
So we want to encourage you. Let's continue to be faithful and present. Present. Present in God's spirit and present with his people. Amen. And then the next thing I want to encourage you is, again, votes. And so after um, Pastor Lexon gets up and, and receives the tithe and blesses the tithe, you're going to see a video about a special prayer meeting. And then this is in, in regards to re elections, we believe prayer can change things. And we're going to believe for God to bring righteousness in our government. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I can give God some praise for that very challenging, very cutting, very convicting, but it was also a wake-up call type of message to start us off with this amazing series. And the thing that I love that Pastor Tim shared is he talked about the drops of the revival rain, where it was just rains of revival, drops of revival, just dropping and dropping and dropping. But Pastor Norman was, was actually sharing with us that back in history, when there were revivals, some churches said that there were no revivals because they were never even a part of it. So we want to encourage you right now, the reason why they weren't a part of it is because they didn't have a cistern or in other words, a container to actually receive the droplets of revival that was happening. So we want to let you know right now that what that cistern or in other words, that jar might be or not might be, it is, is our small groups. So I want to encourage you that if you are not in a small group, if you are not connected, I want to encourage you to join a small group. And if you are in one, start going consistently if you're not going. Because I've been there before. I, I, like, I felt like it was uncomfortable. I felt like I didn't want to go. Things just got in the way. But I want to encourage you, stay consistent if you are in a small group. And now, if you are consistent, I want to encourage you to start reaching out to somebody else and bring somebody else into your jar. Bring somebody else that you know that needs some community, that needs some love, that needs some compassion. So I want to encourage you that if that's you, take that next step of faith because the time is now. Everyone say now. Amen, amen. And now at this time, now we're going to go ahead and receive our tithes and offering. And our verse for this morning to encourage us comes from the book of 2 of Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So that's just a reminder that when we give to God, we're also giving our financial worry to Him. We're not giving the financial burden of actually stewarding our finances. That's our job. But we're giving Him the worry because we're saying, God, you're our sole provider. So I want to thank everybody that gives online or through our Pearlside app. Also know that we'll have ushers posted at the door if you'd like to give that way. And now let's go ahead and bless the tithe. God, we just come before you and we want to thank you so much for this wake-up call. God, I pray that this message moves all of us, including myself, into a next step and into a next level of obedience. And God, we know that where our treasure is, our heart will be also. So God, especially with tithing, especially with trusting you with our finances, God, you don't even need our money, but you want our heart. So God, I pray that every single person, including myself, will take that next step, a level of obedience. And if that's tithe, God, remind all of us that you will never let us live in lack when we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Pearlside Church, in response to this opening volley of this new series, Discerning These Times, we felt like it was only appropriate for us to do our part as a spiritual family to seek the face of God with prayer and fasting. Yes, come on, we're going to do that together Tuesday night here at our main campus, 6.30 to 7.30. This is on top of your small group, so whoever is willing and able to come, we would invite you in. We want all of those who have a passion to pray, right, who want to see God move, to come and join us as we pray corporately together on yeah. Tuesday night. We'll also have small group uh, prayer points that we can pray for within our discussions this week. And so we want to do our part as a spiritual family across the board to really uh, hunger and be desperate for God so that he can heal our land. Absolutely. So we'll see you Tuesday night, 6.30 to 7.30. For more information, pearlside.org or go to your app and click on a night of prayer. Yeah, praise God for a night of prayer. Come on. We're excited about this. You know, this, prayer doesn't just have to be scheduled and, and all like, you know, what is it, like clean. It can be messy, and that's what's happening. We're just going to have this Tuesday pop-up prayer, and we're fasting. So uh, feel free to join us at the main campus this coming week. Uh, one more thing. I know I talked a lot about voting. Um, a bunch of the local pastors here on, on this island were able to in, interview different governor candidates, gubernatorial candidates, and uh, with the primary elections coming up. So if you need to, 
be informed on who you should vote for. I believe Vicky Cayetano's up there. Uh, jo 